Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast of a bunch of writers sitting around drinking tasty beverages and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are Chaz and Karen Brenchley, and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 125, Hope Punk with Becky Chambers. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh, we're very exciting to have you. You've written a bunch of stuff. You are a Hugo nominee and a, and a Hugo winner and award winners. You just amazing collection of books here. And we're very excited. Well, thank you. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I have written some stuff. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I intend to keep doing so. So it's, uh, it's always a delight to be around other folks who also write stuff. I thought we would start with a talk about Hope punk in general, because it was a term that I'd never heard of. And then when I heard it, your name was married to it, like, you know, salt and pepper and sugar and spice. <laughs> so it, it yeah. seems to be the opposite of of everything that has gone towards nihilistic grimdark. And well, so here's here's the funny thing about hope punk is um, this is not a moniker I, I chose. Um, I had somebody come up to me at a con a few years ago and said, so how do you feel about your work being called Hope Punk? And I said, I don't know what that is. Um, so it's, <laughs> um, some, I, I am delighted to have been, I can't say assigned. That's so, that's so uh, sterile. We'll say we'll gifted the term, I think, I, or, or adopted into the, the broader umbrella of that. I do think it's a, it's a fantastic thing that is happening. And I, I do see it very much as a response to, um, to grimdark and dystopia. And when I say that, I, I always want to be careful because I'm, I'm not knocking grim darker dystopia at all some of some of my favorite stories are are on the darker side i enjoy that stuff we need that oh, too, no. but totally right i was um, seeing hope punk is something that could start in a grim dark world i mean <laughs> not all of the worlds that you write in about are, are perfect but it's maybe life sucks and maybe the political situation is challenging and maybe we've done horrible things to the environment and Make better choices and fight for better choices and be human. I mean, be we are, can't all be Greta Thunberg. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, see, the, the 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 thing about hope, right, is that it can't exist without pain or without struggle. Like, I think a lot of people confuse hope with optimism, which they're, they're very close cousins, but it's not necessarily the same thing. It's not, uh, hope punk is not necessarily a feel good story or, you know, something where a story where nothing bad happens, something that's really sugarcoated or, you know, is, is told through rose colored glasses. Hope punk deals with the rough stuff and it has to, I, I feel like you can't really talk about hope if you don't talk about what it is you're getting better from like what is it you're yeah. improving upon what is it you're pushing through and so in that in my own work I find it very important to to confront that stuff and to not shy away from the the darker things or the the you know the, the tragic things the sad things because without that you don't show the opportunity to heal absolutely so who else do you feel is working within that same hope punk envelope it's a great question. I think, let's see, off the top of my head, um, Charlie Jane Anders, I would definitely oh, say, has yeah. done works in that vein. Uh, also, uh, Rika Aoki, um, who just came out with um, uh, Light from Uncommon Stars, which is a, a fantastic novel that I can't stop talking about. But both of their works are are ones that deal with some some heavy stuff, that deal with some some scary things, some some really rough subjects, and yet you come out the other side feeling like the world is a little more beautiful and a little bit better for it. So yeah, those are the and I know there are many others, but those are those are the ones at top of mind. You know, in a weird sort of way, one could view the last Mad Max as being a little bit of hope punk. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. You know, here's, a, here's a crappy environment in the world. We've created a mess and you can ignore all the, the, the plot holes that we can drive a large speaker filled truck through. But <laughs> in the end, it was somebody saying, right, we're going to have to put on our big girl pants and do good things and do human things and be nice to people and work together 
and that's how we're going to survive. And I think that's an important message. I think, I mean, I think that's the the punk part of it, right? Mm. Because when, when people talk, you know, sort of anything punk, most people think aesthetic, right? When you're talking um, cyberpunk or, or steampunk, most people think, oh, this is a, a certain look or a certain feel. But punk to me, it implies rebellion. It implies radical thinking. It implies destroying the status quo and building something anew. And so for, to my mind, hope is radical within our, our, like our current reality. Absolutely. You know, to, to look at all these massive problems we're facing and all these terrifying (laughs) things we're, we're, we're in the middle of and, and that nobody really seems to know how to grapple with, to look at that and say, you know what, I think it could be better. And I'm, I, I refuse to give up and I refuse to, to let this beat me down. I mean, that, that's, that's defiant at its core, I think. That's sort of like saying that pink is the hope punk as opposed to the old, well, showing my age, the Smiths were kind of grimdark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I also like that in a lot of your books, and you, you feature new ideas that nonconformity, don't follow the rules. I love that you play with gender fluidity and multiculturalism. And I think all of these are important representational things to have in all of our future as more and more people come to accept that the world is not A or B. Right. I, I mean, to me, it's just honest. It's yeah. just depicting the world as it is. You know, um, I have loved science fiction my entire life, but for far too long a time, you know, those, the stories I was reading were futures about a very narrow slice of humanity. Um, I didn't see myself in those stories. I didn't see my friends in those stories. And so when I go about writing the, you know, things in that vein, it's not, to, to me, there's there's no real conscious choice in it. It's just obvious. Like, why why would I write a future that didn't have people like me and mine in it? You know, um, it's it's just a, a, it's as simple as depicting the world as I see it, as I experience it, and making sure that the futures I write are about humanity as a whole, not just humanity. You know, so long as it fits certain categories. I, I was thinking about this in the humanity way of it. You use robots as their own race, and I like that. And you make them unique, like the, the robots of Panga, the self-aware. Screw you! We're going to go wander into the woods, people. <laughs> right. I th- I have so I have a bone to pick with uh, with robots and AI. The the, the very common idea that um, you know what what they want more than anything is to be human, and I say that with all the love in the world. Uh, for commander data, commander data, you know, my, one of my, my, one of my best friends forever, but um, we've, we've done that. And I, I think it's a bit uh, arrogant. It's a bit hubristic to say, well, you know, the, the, obviously any, any other being would want to be like us, right? Like any intelligence we create must want to be like us. Well, why? Like, I'm not sure I want to be like us a lot of days, you know, I think there is a, an, a danger in saying in order for us to value, uh, you know, a sentient being as something uh, worthy of, of rights and dignity and respect, they have to be exactly like us. Like that gets real icky real fast if you, if you dig down into it. So when I write AI or when I write robots, um, I try to make it as clear as possible. They are something distinct, that they don't aspire to be like us, um, that what they are is beautiful and, and, and worthy of um, respect and agency all on its own. For me, one of the first robots that I actually saw were the ones in Star Wars, okay, R2-D2 and C-3PO, who are very distinct not even not even just in personality, but in shape. And they had, I saw all of those. That was one view of robots. And I loved that. But you're right, because humanoid robots, all the way through, you know, Asimov and on, um, our Daniel Olivaw and so on, people seem to think that roboticists are going to make robots that look like humans. And why would we do that? We have humans. Okay. You know, look at, look at the, the, 
There's a new new robot coming out from Amazon that's supposed to be a security robot. And it connects with Alexa, which is another kind of robot. And it connects with all the little robotic things that it has in your house, which isn't creepy at all. But it, <laughs> it, it runs around your house and looks for security problems. And then it will tell Alexa who will call the police or whatever they're going to do. But this kind of thing is the kind of robots that are actually happening now. And they are distinct. They are different. And they have their own, you know, multiple copies of them. They're not, you know, they don't have independent brains, but they don't look like humans. No, that, that uh, I'm having, I'm having a brain blast here and we'll we'll see if this is anything we'll find out together because this is not completely half big thought, but um, you, you mentioned 3PO and R2 who, I adored as a kid. So they're very much a part of my, my formative fabric. But I think uh, if, if you look at the way those two are treated in the movies, it says a lot, doesn't it? Because you've got, on the one hand, you've got R2, who is not at all humanoid. You know, he's, he's got those little lenses that are a little bit face-like, but there's nothing about R2 that's really like a person. He, including his speech. Including his speech, right? He, he, he has a different language. He has different appendages. He moves differently. He has all these different sorts of tools. And we all love R2. Mm -hmm. Right. Like everybody loves R2. If somebody's mean to R2 in the movies, like that's just, you know, that's a no go. Like you can't be mean to R2. Everybody's down with the fact that R2 behaves and speaks and moves differently. 3PO, nobody can stand. 3PO who is not quite human enough right? Like he, he's supposed to be a protocol droid. He's supposed to be there to, to help us in sort of our, our daily social activities, but he's really obnoxious and he's really cloying and he doesn't quite get the rules in the same way. And it's funny how we look at R2 and we're like, oh, we love R2. That's our buddy. Even though it's something we, we can't really relate to in the same way we're, we embrace him for what he is, but we don't do the same to 3PO. Right, because no. he doesn't quite fit the same criteria. So I think just justice for three PO is what is what I'm getting. At I, I want to back up a little bit, even before Star Wars, because my first robot love affair and the first robot I ever cried over was Huey, Dewey, and Louie from Silent Running. Oh I, gosh, yeah, that was really, I, yeah, that was really sad. I cried but... my eyes out for those guys. Okay, <laughs> I didn't see those until much, much, much later. So what were you going to say, Chaz? Oh, un- only the, I mean, 3PO stands on the wrong side of the Uncanny Valley. Mm. You know, he's human humanesque. Um, he talks our language, along with however many million others. And, you know, I mean, he has arms and legs, and, and, and he's, a, he's, he's, he's a sort of mockery man, which I think is why we don't like him. He's the Frankenstein's monster. He's the one who's been put together to kind of look like us and these social situations and stuff. And it doesn't work. That's not, that's not how human society works. We, do, we, we don't react well to something that is semi-alien. In fact, if Amazon's new little robot was a, was a humanoid robot, mm. it wouldn't sell. But now, but it's again, it's a cute little R2-D2 kind of thing that zooms around on the floor and is cute. And so it's yeah. other I, side of the Uncanny still, Valley. I still don't entirely see the point of it. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about Terry Bisson's "They're Made Out of Meat" robots? Yes. How can how can meat make noises? There, there's oh, only yeah. one sentient race, and they're made out of meat. To something like that. <laughs> yes. But your yeah. robots are your robots are different. They're a little human, but not too human. But faithful to programming, yet unique. I like them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I admit to liking my robots too. You know, one, one of the things I, I always try for, this is another, I guess I have a lot of bones, just bones to pick about robots, but, <laughs> <laughs> but one of them, one of the things I, I, I do, I have, I have done thus far, at least um, regardless of which series we're talking about is I, one of the things I always try to provide a, a counterpoint to is this idea that logic and emotion are incompatible and our polar opposites. Um, I think it's just a completely backwards notion. Like both of these qualities exist in us and we, I mean, we don't always handle it fine, but we handle it, you know, and this, the whole idea that, that emotion corrupts logic, right? You often have robots or AI who uh, develop uh, emotion and go insane or become, you know, sort of like 
murderously deranged um, or or can't handle it. Right. They they become, start to become too human and they can't handle it. I, I think that that it's just it's never made sense to me, that thinking. Um, and so I, I just see emotion as as part and parcel of the conscious self-reflective experience and so my machines feel stuff if they're if they're smart enough to be able to reflect on the world then then they can have feelings about it and uh yeah Yeah. you also had a path that many people dream of to stardom and i'm thinking of it in terms of you originally started by self-publishing and then moved on and got picked up won awards and everybody wanted to publish you after that Tell me a little bit about, you know, young Becky and the choice you made to say, I'm on a self-publish Kickstarter, all of that business. What, what would I, I know it's kind of the business side and less interesting than robots, but un, unravel it a little for us. I'm, I'm always happy to talk the business side. So, um, so this was, gosh, this was almost 10 years ago. Um, the, uh, it's a little bit grubby, but I mean, the initial crux of it was I, I was out of work. <laughs> I needed, I needed uh, to, to eat. I needed to pay my rent. Um, I was, I was freelancing at the time, um, sort of cobbling together terrible content writing jobs here and there. Um, I I did have like a a weekly column where I did video game reviews, but it was, it was extremely piecemeal and I was constantly scraping by. And uh, there reached this point where I was, um, you know, I was about two thirds of the way through the long way to a small angry planet and uh, my freelance work dried up. It was just one of those, one of those things that happens where I just, I couldn't land any gigs and I had this choice. I was like, okay, I can either, you know, drop everything and go get a job job, which would have been the sensible thing to do. Uh, or I can, I can try for one last Hail Mary here. And uh, cause I really want to finish this book. And so I, I turned to Kickstarter and said, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to finish this thing. Um, can you help me out? I need two months <laughs> to, to, you know, to, to bridge the gap there. And uh, to my eternal surprise, it was successful. I, I made this deal with myself ahead of time that if the campaign wasn't successful, it was sort of a, I don't believe in signs from the universe, but I decided it was a sign from the universe that like, <laughs> It was time to to drop all this writing nonsense and you know go be serious and I don't know I don't know what that even means but <laughs> I refuse you know, to grow up we were uh, united <laughs> right right exactly but it was successful and I I finished the book and initially I actually did aim for traditional publishing right out the gate just because I knew it would be a better fit for me um, marketing and self promotion are not my strong suits I, my my brain does not work that way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's it's just never been something I have a knack for, and and that's such a huge part of of self publishing. But uh, you know, I, I wasn't successful with that right out the gate. And if it was just me alone, I would have probably kept trying, kept querying all the stuff you're supposed to do. But I have these backers who, you know, had not only given me money but were wonderfully supportive, just cheering me on the entire time. And I was like, you know, they, they deserve to be able to hold what it is they helped make. And so, um, so I decided to self-publish. That's awesome. And and what, so what happened then? I mean, did, did, did the self-published edition, what make some noise, get noticed and, 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 and a major publisher approached you to, take it on no so here so so here's whenever people say so how do you how do you sell a book i have to say i have absolutely no idea because i again not being great at at marketing or self-promotion i the book didn't sell very well uh self-published i I sold enough copies basically to make back the the money i had spent on cover art you know and i decided that was enough you know i was like cool i broke even outstanding and at that point I had gone and gotten a, uh, you know, a nine to five because, uh, you know, uh, circumstances were dire. And I thought that was it. I I didn't have any immediate plans to, to keep going or keep trying because I just uh, felt that it hadn't really worked out and that I, that I really needed to focus on, you know, being able to, uh, to provide for, for myself and all that good stuff. So it was a chance meeting at, at Worldcon in 2014, I it was my first Worldcon, and uh, I was at a party, 
And I met this woman and we hit it off and we had some beers as you do at Worldcon. And uh, I believe that. <laughs> and I didn't talk about the book at all. We were just chatting and, you know, I gave her my card and cause I wanted to keep in touch. And that was that. Uh, and then a few months later, <laughs> she, uh, she emailed me out of the blue and said, um, you know, I'm an, I'm an editor, which was news to me. I didn't know. Uh, but yeah, she was a commissioning editor and had, read the long way and was like, I'd, I'd really like to offer you a contract for this. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that was, that was how that got started. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, every writer I know who's been traditionally published has a different story and, and I love them all. It's that's, that's one of the things that, I, you know, so baby writers come to me now and say, Chaz, Chaz, how do I break in? And I have absolutely no idea how you break into contemporary publishing. Because, I, you know, I mean, I did it 40-something years ago. And it, the, you know, the world has changed entirely since then. Publishing particularly is changing constantly these days, which it, it used to be this very fixed formal thing. When I was a baby writer, you could describe absolutely how you got published. Um, it was one way, and, and it worked that way for centuries, literally, um, and that was what you did. Um, and, and now, you know, there are so many choices, so many alternatives, um, and it's lovely, and, and, and I adore how I got into publishing stories because they're all different. Well, one, one thing, Becky, that, that you did absolutely right, and this is something that in my life just worked out, is you went to Worldcon mm. and you met people. Mm. I met people way back in, I forget the list, but it was the only, oh, Genie, that was it. G-E-N-I-E was, a, um, was a, a mailing list with different subgroups and stuff. And that's where all the science fiction writers were. And one of my friends in the SCA just happened to be a science fiction writer and, and she pulled me into things. And, and so I talked to people on online and then I would go to conventions and I would meet them in person and so on and so forth. And that's just how I grew. I, I have a ton of friends, all of whom are science fiction writers. And oh yeah, one of them introduced me to my husband. That's also a good <laughs> side effect. She's prejudiced that way. Yeah, but, but but that's what they tell you to do in business too. It's just go meet people. Oh, oh! I have a business question for you, Becky. Yes. So you you wrote this fabulously successful series, um, The Wayfarers, mm -hmm. and every book is different, separated. Yeah, you can read them in any order; it doesn't matter. And after four books, you said, "No, I'm done." Why did you do that? I just knew it was time to be done. I, I ended the series for the same reason that I never wrote a direct sequel to The Long Way. You know, the, after The Long Way came out and it did well, people would say, you know, are you going to are you going to write another book about the crew of the Wayfarer? Mm -hmm. And I always said no, because I didn't have anything more for them. And I was very resistant to the idea of just milking another story out of them for the sake of having the long way too. I thought that would just cheapen the whole thing. Yes. And it wasn't what I wanted to write, you know? And so after I wrote The Galaxy and the Ground Within, which is the, the last Wayfarer's novel, I just knew that was it. I just I just knew in my gut that that, that was enough. You know, I, I, I sat with that a long time. Like that was, you know, it's a big decision to make to say, this is the end now, you know, especially, especially when it is something that is doing well, you know, there's that, that fear that comes along with it too, of, you know, what's going to happen if I leave this behind or, you know, are people yeah. going to people, are people going to like what I do outside of this? I don't know, yeah. but I just felt that, that trying to, you know, sort of scrape the barrel when there was nothing left for it, okay. uh, that, that wasn't the path I wanted to take. Yeah. And I, I also, you know, I first started, you know, scribbling the the little bits and pieces that would become the Wayfarers universe yeah. when I was 20 years old. And I'm 36 now. And that's <laughs> that's a long time to be in one place, you know. And I and that's that's an absolutely not to dock writers who, you know, um, build their world and, and spend their whole career mm -hmm. there. Absolutely not. But for me personally, I I didn't want to 
get stuck. I didn't want to get pigeonholed. I didn't want to just stay in one place. There were other things I wanted to explore. And I, I just felt that I was growing somewhere else, even though I was, you know, immensely proud of, of what I'd made um, and always will be that, you know, it was just time for me to move on. Sure. Well, one, one thing I've noticed, so you have, you know, yes, you've moved on. And I, I love the Wayfarer series. I love this home for the world belt. I just read it. I've got to be taught a fortunate on my shelf on the top of the stack. Even though you've left the Wayfarer series, having read a song for the world built, I kind of wondered if it was part of the Wayfarers because you have such a distinctive, such a beautiful way of writing. And, and, and you're very clear about this is where I am. Okay. You're, you, it's, it's very clear that the long way to a small angry planet and a closed to common orbit might've had characters in common but they were still very distinct standalone stories. You didn't have to know all the rest of it to read this. And I'm very impressed by that. I think um, I, I just loved these and I'm very impressed by that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. The, the standalone quality uh, it was something that was important to me because um, a, a big driver behind Wayfarers in particular, but I, I think it applies to all my work is that I, I want to write science fiction that you can hand to somebody who thinks they don't like science fiction or who has never tried science fiction or who feels intimidated by it. Like it's, I'm biased, obviously it's my favorite genre in the world, but it does have this reputation as being difficult or as being hard to get into. You know, there are books out there that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend to somebody who was a newbie because, you know, there, there, there are some that you, you kind of have to have been around the sci-fi block a few times <laughs> before yeah. you're ready for it. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't want to scare people off. Like I want to, you know, provide plenty of nutritious uh, substance for people who have been kicking around the genre for, for a long time. You know, I, I want to write for those folks too, but the, with with Wayfarers, part of it was I wanted it to be easy to jump in. You know, I, we've all had that experience where someone's like, oh, have you read such and such? And then they hand you 12 books and you go, mm. oh, God, you know, um, and I mean, that's great for me because I'll happily read 12 books, but it does scare people off. You know, well, I, there, there's also yeah. the great fear that what if she stops writing before the story is done? Like yeah. certain people that we will not mention. And there's so many that we cannot mention. <laughs> And there's a lot of people who are like, I have I have my arms strictly folded here. You can't see, but it's like, I ain't buying any new series until they're all out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that, that, that's the best way to kill a series, because if you don't buy the early books. It's true. I know. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it is yeah, a Kobayashi Maru here. Follow on. So one of the things I wanted to say, that you're, you're, the first one of yours I read was The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. And Chaz and I actually kind of, I had just started it and, um, and he saw it and asked me about the title and you know, it's, it's exactly what it's about. Yes. It's about the long way to a small angry planet. That was just the perfect title. It describes the book perfectly. And I loved how it ended and it was, it was, I just loved it. And, um, and again, I, like I said before, I like that they all have the same feel, the same kindness to them, even though, Bad things happen. It, it's not. It's not lovely and pretty and roses and you know all of that kind of stuff. But you have such a unique voice, and I enjoy it so much. Well, thank you. One one of the things about you know writing each of them as their own their own entity, I guess, is I'm I'm still me as I go along. You know, <laughs> like I think I think that's I, even if um, you know even outside of Wayfarers too. I do think in some ways I'm just writing one series or maybe it's not even a series at all. I'm always just writing where I'm at at mm-hmm. the moment. You know, um, I don't outline and I, I don't really plan ahead. So whatever ends up in there tends to be just where I was in the moment. Like for me looking at them and, you know, obviously I have <laughs> the most, the most biased view of my own work of mm-hmm. anyone, but I look at them and I, I see like, oh, I couldn't have written this book at, you know, any other time. Oh, obviously I wrote this book where I w- when I was living in such and such place or, you know, this, that, or the other. Like it's it's always very, very rooted in whatever my immediate situation is. I, I have a world building writing sort of question and it might be easy. You, I love your titles. 
I love that they're expressive about what it is about without giving anything away. Which comes first, the story or the title? Oh, the story, definitely. Um, my, <laughs> my publishers um, often play this sort of cat and mouse game with me as I'm, you know, as we're sort of approaching deadline where they're like, do you have a title yet? <laughs> you know, because for marketing reasons, that's very helpful for them. But I, I, I title very late. Okay, that's, that's, that is so interesting because, I mean, your titles are obviously very distinctive and very much you. You know, they may be different series, but they still have a sort of a unique shape to them. Whereas, you, I mean, I, I want a title before I start writing. I, I don't plot or either. I don't plan at all. Um, but I want a title. I want something to write to. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, whatever I'm writing, the title is embedded at the heart of the work. And I really struggle if if I don't have a title until I'm at the end. Um, because once you get to the end, there are so many different choices and none of them is built in. And you could just pick any and I get I get all confused and worried and anxious. <laughs> you know, yes. yes I do, astonishingly. You won't believe this of me. No, not at all. Um, you're not alone. I have I have plenty of friends who who demand on having like a title is what grounds them yeah. right like you know, that's that i am writing this this is my anchor yeah. um, and i totally get that and don't do that at all <laughs> <laughs> for me it's it's that i don't know what the shape of the story is yet i get anxious if i if i do try like hold myself to too much at the beginning like i like to i like to be very loosey-goosey and nebulous when i'm starting because Often uh, what the book turns into is so different than what my initial, um, you know, my initial idea or my initial concept was. I went back a few months ago and was looking at um, my my early notes for The Galaxy and the Ground Within. Um, just, you know, I was looking something up and m- my first brainstorming stuff for that if, if I wasn't me, I wouldn't know it was the same book. Like there's nothing <laughs> about it that's recognizable. So I, I think part of, of waiting to title something for me is, is, is just making space for the, the, the organized chaos that I know <laughs> my writing process be right. and, and giving it room to evolve as it goes along. Well, what are you working on right now? And I, clearly you can't give us a title or anything, but Tell me a, th- a theme. Give us a hint of your themes for your current work. So I can I can talk a little bit about it. I am in, in that situation where it's something that hasn't Absolutely. been announced yet. So I have to, you know, I have to be cagey. Um, but I am I'm working on a new novel, um, science fiction, of course. Um, Monk and Robot, uh, so Song for the Wild Built and um, A Prayer for the Crown Shy, which will be out next year, um, are not spacey books. Um, uh, but the, the pendulum has swung back the other way and I'm writing something very, very spacey and very alien. It's it's a standalone and it's not tied to To Be Taught If Fortunate, but I would say in terms of tone and focus on science, it's it's very much in that sort of category. I would say that's the, the closest comparison I have to, you know, some, something similar that I've done previously. Um, but I am headed in, in new directions and, and really enjoying getting weird with it yeah Uh, (laughs) did you have do you yourself have a background in science not formally so i i i am the weird artsy one in the family i i I studied theater but my my whole family is is involved in in stem one way or another my Mm -hmm. mom is an astrobiology educator Uh, my dad is retired now but he was an aerospace engineer he worked in satellites uh, my brother is a chemistry tutor. My grandfather was a you know, old school rocket scientist. He worked, mm. worked in orbital mechanics. So, I mean, it's just, this was the environment I yeah. grew up in. Uh, you, I, I just absorbed it. Yeah. Did you, did you say astrobiology? I did say astrobiology. Because I, I want to know what is astrobiology? So astrobiology is an interdisciplinary field that studies the potential for life on other planets it is it is the me so you take what we know about the formation of the universe and the galaxy and the solar system you take what we know about planetary science in the inorganic sense you know how does a planet work you take what you know from a biological standpoint from an evolutionary biology standpoint of how how 
to the best of our knowledge, how did life happen? What are the criteria for life as we know it? Because there may be stuff out there that doesn't follow the rules right now. We're working with a sample size of one being. (laughs) Um, And based on all of that information, you can then start doing a more targeted search for where might we find this elsewhere? So, you know, things like when we talk about uh, habitable zones around exoplanets, mm-hmm. um, the exploratory missions going on around uh, icy moons, such as you know Europa, Enceladus, Titan, all of that falls into the 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 category of astrobiology. You know, what should we be looking for if we're looking for life? I love that. I go, I really do. I, it's much better than saying what are we looking for with intelligence, because that way leads to snark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will put all of these things on our website that we've been talking about, which is www.ridersdrinkingcoffee.com. Thank you so much for being with us today, Becky. Is there um, anything else that you can advise to you can give a new writer? Advice to give a new writer. Take good care of yourself is the best mm-hmm. advice. I know that we, we in, in any creative field, uh, tend to romanticize burning out and, you know, uh, bleeding, crying, sweating over a project. But um, remember that this is a marathon, not a sprint, and that you are more important than anything you could write, and that good art comes from um, happy humans. So take yeah. naps, <laughs> eat, eat, your, eat your vegetables, and uh, you know, make, make sure um, that you're, you're, you're being kind to yourself while you make something beautiful. Thank you. That's really beautiful to say. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web magic is care of Deirdre Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with the Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jekyll Designs and whatever neighborhood coffee shop is nearest you. And hey... Thanks for listening.